Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session on human versus machine, AlphaGo, and artificial intelligence. I am uh, incredibly excited and honored to be here with these three extraordinary individuals. I know that some people get excited about meeting uh, Jackie Chan, others about uh, Jeremy Lin. I was so excited to be meeting uh, Mr. Lee and these two that uh, I became a huge hero in my own family because I was going to meet him. Uh, before we begin, can I ask people to refrain from taking pictures during the session? I know you're all as excited as I am, uh, but I'd like to give our participants an opportunity to actually speak, and then maybe afterwards there might be some opportunity. Uh, the way we'll structure this session today is uh, a couple minutes introduction. Uh, we'll have about 20 minutes of discussion. We may summarize again, continue for another 20 minutes. You will have an opportunity for Q&A. I suspect there'll be quite a lot. Uh, and then we'll have a couple minutes closing. My name is May Lee. I'm the Dean of the Business School, the School of Entrepreneurship and Management at Shanghai Tech University. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be here with these three. Uh, I'm gonna start at the end, actually, with Wendell Wallach. He's a very well-known uh, bioethicist. He actually is uh, on the staff at uh, Yale University on the Center for Ethics. Uh, he has published, actually, most recently, a new book on the intersection of humans and machines called The Dangerous Master, and I believe it's about to be published and translated into Chinese this year. Is that correct? Should be published within a couple months. Okay. Uh, and then we have Dilip George, who is the co-founder and CTO of Vicarious. It's a company focused on building next generation AI algorithms, and I believe you have a focus on achieving human level intelligence and vision language and motor control. And we will talk about some of that, obviously, later today. And then uh, immediately to my left is the man who needs no introduction, uh, Mr. Lee Sodol, Lee Shishi, who is, of course, uh, the world champion in Go, uh, nine dan ranked, uh, often regarded as the greatest player in Go history over 2,500 years, and most recently, of course, having endured a five-game match against AlphaGo DeepMind. Uh, so with that, uh, let's begin the session. Um, the title here, of course, is Human versus Machine. And we talk a lot about AI. In fact, as you walk through the various sessions here over the next three days, you see things about robotics, machine learning. You see things about artificial intelligence and neuroscience. And I'm wondering, Dilip, if we could just start by defining what we mean by artificial intelligence. People talk about neural networks, deep learning, machine learning. Could you just spend a couple minutes telling us how we can think about those and how they're related? Sure, thanks, May. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'll first start by defining what intelligence is. Um, intelligence is the ability to learn models of this world and to use the ability to use those models to achieve goals. So when you are born, you don't know much about the world. Uh, through exposure uh, to data, you learned that there are things in the world, objects, that objects collide with each other, etc. When you came to this conference, uh, you probably didn't know about the layout of the conference uh, uh, center, but you learned a model for the conference center so that if you want food, you know where to go. And you learn this model such that even if there is, an, uh, if there is change in, in the environment, you can, adapt, you can adapt your behavior according to the model. So if, you, if the pathway to uh, the food center is blocked, you, you can use that model uh, that you have learned to find another way. So you can be very flexible in the way you use your model in achieving goals in the world. So building models, learning models of the world is uh, what I call intelligence. Now, it is important to distinguish between what I call narrow intelligence and general intelligence. If you look at the natural history of uh, intelligence, there were creatures in this world which were very good at behavior. Dinosaurs are one example. They, they dominated the world for a long time. They were very good at moving around, uh, hunting. Uh, they were the dominant species on Earth. But that is an example of narrow intelligence. When the world changed, they couldn't adapt. Uh, they couldn't learn fast enough. Their, their machinery was custom trained for the narrow task of surviving in their environment. Uh, what we have humans is an example of general intelligence. We are very fast at learning uh, new models when the environment changes. And uh, our intelligence is adaptable. We are, we are using models and changing our behavior uh, according to the models. So we are, our intelligence is general purpose, flexible, and adaptive. So that is, that is an example of general intelligence. Artificial intelligence is the, is the endeavor of creating all kinds of intelligent forms. 
you can be creating narrow applications using a lot of data to train custom systems for a particular narrow application, or you could be creating general intelligence systems. So it, it spans the, the whole spectrum of uh, small creatures intelligence to dinosaur intelligence to human intelligence. Um, I think that covers most of intelligence. So is machine learning the same as artificial intelligence? Machine learning is a technique uh, of uh, learning from data to create artificial intelligence applications. So it strikes me, and this is something that Wendell, you've spent some time on, that what we've done here with AlphaGo and where we are with the human mind, we could say there's a huge gap. There is really a huge gap. We've really dealt with narrow intelligence in nearly all applications so far. But even when you think of something like the game of Go, it takes place on a board. It's a constrained universe. We human beings, we function in countless environments every day. They're very open-ended. They are not bounded. There's uncertainty. We have lack of information about things that we have to deal with. So, and we are conscious. You are all here conscious, aware of what's going on. Machines haven't even approached this kind of ability. So we are a vast distance between what we have achieved and what is yet to be realized. So I want to come back to the consciousness issue, but another thing that people say is that machine learning is all about crunching statistics. So massive amounts of numbers, computational power, which then leads you, for instance, in the game of Go, to something very simple. Simple, as opposed to artificial intelligence where we think of Blade Runner or Ex Machina, where you actually have something that looks and behaves like a human being that requires planning, it requires, as you say, adaptation. There's quite a lot of adaptation that happens in Go. There's quite a lot of adaptation and thinking and planning that happens in Go. And maybe this is a good opportunity for me to now switch to Mr. Lee. I actually, I, I took a quote from uh, Dilip's uh, homepage and it says that vicarious is bringing us all closer to a future where computers perceive, imagine, and reason just like humans. And so I think one of the questions I have for Mr. Lee is, how did it actually feel to play against AlphaGo versus playing a human being? I'm very surprised, actually, because for the goal, it has a lot of uncertainties. Compu computer may, may not reach that level. That was what I was thinking. But now you realize that you know the result. I lost the game one to four. I was surprised, actually, because Go has a lot of uncertainties. You have to have your intuition, and also you have to have a perceived uh, capability. That was my idea. But through this kind of a match, we have the uh, rules of the game. So under that circumstances, computation or algorithm can be realized and to have victory. At that time, I did not feel that Alpha was playing Go with me. And also, as in you have uh, witnessed and observed, when Alpha met unexpected steps, he would have uh, loopholes in his move, even though he was surprising. But he, it has limitations. That was my experience. Let me ask a specific question in game one. You played a move in 102, or I think Go, uh, AlphaGo played a move, and apparently you expressed a great deal of surprise. You expressed an actual emotion. And of course, when you play human opponents, they too express an emotion. When AlphaGo doesn't, how did that affect your play? <coughs> Human beings has a lot of uh, psychological movement. Even though he has the uh, precise answer, he might choose to go a different path. And maybe he will consider the overall uh, move or strategy, etc. So there will be waverings. But for Alpha, it will not waver. So this is difficult for me, for human beings. Um, playing games with machines, man is at a disadvantage. For example, 
the third game when it was finished. If it was a human being playing. For each game, for the previous three games, the games would be different. But for Alpha, psychologically, he was not uh, impacted. And uh, he will not have that kind of uh, psychological uh, thinking or uh, movement. So that was a surprising experience for me. But if I had another chance to play with him, it might be more difficult. Uh, before AlphaGo played you, played the Chinese player Fan Hui, and he described it as a very strong and stable, almost like a wall, that although he knew as a computer that if no one had told him, he thought that the player was a little bit strange, but a very strong player nonetheless. Mm -hmm. And when I actually looked at the paper uh, published by the DeepMind team in Nature, the final version of AlphaGo used 40 search threads, 48 CPUs, and 8 GPUs, uh, with multiple machines, 40 search threads, ultimately in the end, 1,200 CPUs and 176 GPUs, supported by 100 scientists. So you can actually look at this from a number of ways. And it played millions of games, whereas the average Go player over his or her lifetime plays tens of thousands of games. So if you were to actually measure what you played, one way to look at it is the energy consumed by those machines, which would be about a kilowatt. And the average human, human being uses about 100 watts. So you could have been seen as playing against 10 men, plus the 100 scientists backing AlphaGo. So does that seem fair? <laughs> how do you, I mean, if you think about it from that context, I'm curious how that, how that feels to you, because so many people talk about this as if there are feelings involved. And of course, that will be the second part of our discussion, which is it's very odd to think about machines and feelings. In fact, playing with Alpha, Prior to the match, I watched the five matches he played with Fan Hui for deep learning. I'm not very much familiar with that. I was not paying great attention to it. But I watched his play with Fan Hui. I thought he was not a rival. But after the deep learning, he had the deep learning I played go with him. I was pretty sure that I could win, but the deep learn technology in six months could advance so much. That was unexpected. So I was very much surprised. And also, as I have said, as you have asked, whether it's fair or not for this kind of game, I don't think it's an issue like this, because computers has its own features. In addition to that, it was a pity that uh, because for deep learning technology, I, will, I had little knowledge of it. I had a, a misjudgment, actually. At that time, I thought AlphaGo cannot uh, be the level of top Go player. So that was my misjudgment of the uh, deep learning. And this is a major contributor for my failure. I have two final questions. Game four was the one that you won. And people often refer to move 78 as the hand of God move. What was the difference in how you played those two matches? And what was the difference in how AlphaGo played those matches, those games against you? Well, if you play the uh, black, you must be very active. 
in order that you can take the lead because you only have a 48 uh, percentage of opportunities to win. So I didn't uh, take uh, the uh, attacking position. AlphaGo, as a matter of fact, is a very well designed. It has a lot of uh, information. If I can play again with AlphaGo, I believe uh, that I have uh, more opportunity to win. However, I don't really think that I want to play with AlphaGo again. So in the fourth game, I won because of its uh, fatal loophole in its logic. In the fifth game, AlphaGo had another logic loophole. In spite of that, I lose. So it's very difficult for men to defeat machine. That's how I think. Opinion, you don't want to play AlphaGo again. But my last question amongst the 10,000 I have listed here is, if you were to play AlphaGo again, how would you prepare differently than you prepared for this last set of matches? <laughs> So before I play with AlphaGo, I need to have a lot of exercises in my mind because it's not a game with human beings. There are a lot of differences. So I imagined a lot. I imagined a lot as to how to play with AlphaGo. As I mentioned just now, I had a lot of miscalculations or misjudgment. As a result, I lose the game. I lost the game. However, if I can play again now with AlphaGo, I believe with the, the data I have all already collected from the previous uh, game, I have more opportunities to win. But in spite of that, well, I don't want to play it with again. But anyway, I hope that if there are opportunities, I will take the challenge. You don't have to answer, but I just, I'm curious. <laughs> oh. Mm. Oh, really Oh, this is because uh, there is no exchanges of emotions with AlphaGo while I was uh, playing with it. I had a lot of uh, planning before I actually played with AlphaGo. However, in the game, the difficulty and pressure were simply out of your imagination because it did not have any feelings, any emotions. Uh, it's very difficult for you to play with uh, the machine without any feelings and emotions. Perfect segue. I want to now ask Wendell, because this really is your area. Um, the heart of the question around human versus machine is that we would have to coexist with them. And either they'll be our servants, we'll be their masters, they'll be our equals, or we'll have an adversarial relationship. But the real question is what is at the heart of the relationship. And so much of the language that we use to talk about it is human related. So deep learning, machine intelligence, artificial intelligence, does that in fact influence how we think about it in a negative or positive way? And what implications does that have for us? Well, it certainly influences how we think about it. But in many ways, these words, we use them very glibly. And what's actually going on in the machine capabilities is quite a bit different than what we might think is being talked about. So deep learning is a new algorithmic process, but it is a very constricted form of learning. And yet it is a powerful form of learning that not only will win at AlphaGo, but is helping 
analyze data about liver diseases and other conditions that may actually have some great therapeutic value as we go along. But when we hear the word learning, we give it a much broader meaning than is actually implicit in what's going on in deep learning. Nevertheless, it is a powerful technique and we can't play it down. At the same time, as we get involved in these human-machine comparisons, which are fascinating because they may help us think more deeply about how we are similar to and how we may truly differ from the machines that we are creating. But initially, we look at it largely in terms of these simple goals. Who won the game? Who won the game is very different than what kind of game did Lee play versus what kind of game did AlphaGo play. They were not engaged in doing the same thing. So Lee with only 10 or 20 or 30,000, I have no idea how many games he's played or studied, truly was bringing all kinds of creative capacities to bear that weren't being implemented in the machine. So what is truly remarkable is that he played so well, revealing again how remarkable we humans are as creatures, even if we took another hit to our pride in that the machines ultimately beat us. On the other hand, to characterize the machine as just engaged in digital processing or mathematical activity, well, if this is truly the beginning of learning and the beginning of what has been characterized as artificial intelligence, well, there's a sense in which it has transcended just being simple mathematics or simple digital processing. So in the same way as we wouldn't want to characterize all of our capabilities as just biochemical processing or even computational processing going on in our brain, perhaps we need to begin to think about these computer capabilities as something more than purely mechanical. So let me just interrupt because game is often described as a, a go is often described as a game of strategy, tactics, and most importantly, creativity. And that's something that, you know, Mr. Lee is is a master at, so he plays the unexpected move. Right. He's, and so what you've just described then is, have we gone beyond, so AlphaGo had two sets of uh, neural networks, deep learning, they ran them through two sets. It, it learned from humans, then it learned from itself, and it continued to learn. And I think that they say that's what accounted for the change in the intervening five months. Exactly. So yeah. is it simply then just number crunching or has AlphaGo become creative? And how do we think about that context when we think about the implications of what happened in that match and for the future of AI and how we interact with those machines? Well, it's certainly taken actions and the papers and the analysis of these matches show that it did a couple surprising things. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what are those surprising things and how should we look at that? Is that really creativity? But then you can reverse the question and say, well, what's creativity for humans? And this is making us think again very deeply about what we think is and is not creative about what we do. So often we're also making unusual connections. But in an earlier game, that these game learning algorithms play, there was also a very unusual strategy that blows everybody's minds when they see the, the learning algorithm implement the strategy in Breakout. But the point is, it's surprising for anybody who's not played thousands of games of Breakout. For those who have, they have witnessed that strategy happening and therefore that's a strategy that may be implemented over and over again. So I think that's something that perhaps AlphaGo is dealing with. Whether it was truly creative or whether it had just witnessed millions of games or played millions of games and saw something unique happen, that it was then able to retrieve that in a similar situation, we really don't know. And not only do we not know, but Demise Hassabis, the game playing genius who helped found DeepMind, one of the three principles in DeepMind, and led this effort, he couldn't fully explain either 
what AlphaGo did. He just knew that he had a few techniques, and not just deep learning, but also something called a Monte Carlo search mm -hmm. was very important. He had these techniques that he thought he could implement to create a genius computer Go player. Philip, do you have a yeah, response? I can, I can <laughs> add uh, some shade to this. Um, so think of games in general. Why don't we play basketball with uh, the hoop two feet off the ground? Uh, because it is not challenging enough. <laughs> if the basketball hoop is 30 feet off the ground, it is too challenging. So games are by design, designed to challenge, to be just, just at the edge of challenging for us. Uh, and when it comes to games like Go, what is challenging for us is uh, our working memory, the amount of search that we can do. If I rattle out a random sequence of uh, 30 digits, nobody in, the, in, in this audience will be able to remember those uh, exact sequence of digits. A computer has no problem with that. And so a computer, when it comes to this game, comes with a completely different trade-off. Uh, so what it lacks in intuition, uh, so what, uh, what is called intuition is pattern recognition using neural networks. So even if a little bit of advancement in pattern recognition happens, it can augment it that using much deeper search uh, you can, and much bigger computing power. So AlphaGo will play the game in a completely different manner compared to how humans are playing. We are challenged by our working memory and the amount of search that we can do. So we have to be much more creative, whereas the program has no such challenge. And so it will com come up with completely different strategies, which we, when we look at it, will say it's creative, but it might not be. So uh, we, we humans tend to ascribe creativity to, to machines whenever it surprises us, but it could be a completely different trade-off in the way uh, the computer is playing the game. Would you, Mr. Lee, would you like to say something? Uh, so I feel uh, for you and I share your opinions just now. Indeed, AlphaGo on a few number of occasions uh, played in a very surprising way and this is diff very difficult for machines. However, it has managed to do it. Then what is uh, creativity? As a matter of fact, AlphaGo doesn't know that he's a playing Go. In spite of that, he had a number of very creative moves. And therefore, it's important for us to consider what creation really is and what being creative cre creative really means. So I believe uh, that uh, uh, so being creativity, being creative uh, is different for man and uh, for machine. And usually, so we cannot create if it goes beyond our uh, perception. But it's, uh, it's different for machines. Uh, the interaction between human and machine. Where is the line, actually? And the fear that we have, so much fear that we have about machines taking over and ordering us around, as it were. And Wendell, I would like to ask you that specific question, but before we get there, as a practical matter, this milestone in AI, what are the practical applications that we could imagine from AlphaGo's achievements in sort of day-to-day -day life? So for instance, I would love to have somebody iron my shirt, but <laughs> presumably there are, uh, there are actual real day-to-day -day health applications or health, you know, healthcare. Are there, how do we think about that in the context of the economy, of education, of startups? Uh, okay. Well, there are many different things that go on in this kind of learning and why deep learning became such an important technology was that it solved basic problems in learning and perception that had bedeviled researchers into artificial intelligence for the last 20 or 30 years, so much so that many of them began to believe that these were unsolvable problems. But let me just give you a simple one. Looking at a picture and being able to accurately label what the objects were in the picture. So deep learning algorithms have been able to do that. And that 
that can probably translate into facial recognition software and maybe even autonomous driving and so forth, having a better recognition about the nature of the environment, maybe distinguishing between a plastic bag blowing in the wind and a real object that it had to be concerned with in, in terms of its driving habits. So there are those aspects. But the other is this ability to look at a vast amount of data without any training on what this data e even is. Just to look at that data flow and start to recognize patterns and relationships that are within that data and perhaps even come up with patterns and relationships that would be very difficult for a human to recognize. So the next thing that DeepMind, for example, is doing, and it's not just DeepMind, deep learning is being applied in many different fields, but they have just, um, they have just made a contract with the, um, the health service in Britain where they are given access to a massive amount of data about liver diseases. And they are going to explore that data to see if that will reveal some information, some patterns that might be helpful in curing those diseases. So that's really what we're moving into, at least with these deep learning algorithms. It's not some sophisticated kind of learning, and yet it's very powerful when applied to massive databases. The important thing here is that you have a massive database about a subject that the algorithm can learn from. Delete. Yeah, so uh, I uh, agree with uh, Wendell. Um, uh, in any domain where there is a lot of data, uh, and w whenever there is a valuable domain, for example, self-driving cars is one example where it is very valuable to have that application. And uh, whenever there is a valuable domain, companies uh, are willing to invest a lot in gathering data there. And in those uh, applications, uh, deep learning uh, and uh, in this case, deep learning and reinforcement learning combined together uh, will have a lot of impact. Uh, at the same time, uh, it is worth uh, looking at this uh, achievement as an opportunity to think about what would be the next uh, revolution in artificial intelligence. Yeah. So uh, Google's uh, self-driving car has driven millions of miles and it is still not at the, at the level of dexterity and flexibility as, uh, of a human. Um, AlphaGo played 100 million games uh, to, to beat uh, uh, Lisa Dole. And now if you change the board size, uh, you know, going from 19 by 19 to 38 by 38, or maybe play on a board with a hole in it, uh, or a torus, torus board, uh, Lee uh, will be able to adapt to those situations much better than uh, AlphaGo uh, because uh, that is trained for that specific purpose with data for that specific purpose. So it, it would be interesting to use this opportunity to think about what would be the next level where you, you can build systems that are uh, as flexible and adaptive like uh, humans uh, do. And about creativity, I think when, whenever we cre you know, uh, create machines uh, which are going to be as creative as humans, even internally in those machines, they will look like number crunching. So they, internally, if you look at it, it might not look very different from how AlphaGo is playing because it is finally all going to be numbers. It is the, di the, the difference uh, between uh, where machines are now and where machines will be in the future is that machines will have models which are similar to humans. Um, currently, the model in AlphaGo is, you know, we give it what, what the model of the game is and uh, it, it uses a different strategy to search through that space and comes up with surprising moves. When, when machines learn models like humans do, uh, which is an outstanding problem, uh, when, when, we, when machines do that, uh, they will start making uh, predictions using those models and those will look as creative as human predictions. But inside those, it will be still number crunching and uh, digital technology. So it will, uh, that won't be able to distinguish between creativity and not creativity. Just a quick follow up. It's important to note that even in the game universe, there are many games that computers do horribly at. Monopoly. Not just worse than humans, they are horrible at that, those kinds of games. So it's largely these logical games. Monopoly. These, um, Monopoly. <laughs> so they become largely games that social knowledge, knowledge about human interaction, um, Sure. unsaids, nuances come into play in a heavy way. 
And they probably do much more in plain Go human on human than they do human on machines, but the machines fail horribly. And, and that points a little bit toward what the limitations of even our most advanced machine intelligences are at this stage of the game. So I have one more technology question, and that is human beings, through our language, the metaphors that we use is that we learn through our brains. But in fact, we have bodies, and we now know through extensive research in neuroscience that we learn through touch, we learn through taste, we learn, we see that children learn through movement, through activity, right? So now we have an education experience-based, project-based, we encourage our children to move because we as human beings learn not simply through our brain, but through all the actual sentient aspects of our body. How does that translate as we think about AI? Yeah, so if you want uh, machines to come to the same conclusions as humans in all kinds of human questions, then machines will have to have body very similar to the humans. They will have to have the same constraints, uh, etc. But that might not be required. We might not want uh, machines to have exactly the same body as humans, uh, etc. Because finally we are going to use the machines to solve problems for us. Uh, and, uh, but it is an interesting question that um, right now most of the AI algorithms are applied where AI is sitting in a uh, black box and not interacting with the world and data is fed to, uh, to it. Whereas uh, human, uh, like, you know, more general purpose uh, AIs will have to interact with the world uh, and have a body, uh, might not be very similar to uh, humans, but should be able to act with that body and uh, uh, observe the consequences of those <coughs> actions uh, and learn from that. Uh, that is an important part of uh, human intelligence. And uh, what is surprising is that most of the, you know, whenever you say, oh, if something, if a program solves this particular problem, uh, it, we will consider it as intelligent. Whenever we have made such decisions, uh, uh, proclamations, we have been wrong. Uh, you know, chess is an example, uh, or any other, any particular game, if you take, that would be an example because there, is, there are ways in which you can crack that particular game by feeding in a lot of data and making a special uh, purpose processor for that. Uh, what, what is interesting is how would you create uh, general uh, intelligence and uh, that requires what is called common sense and common sense is what is missing in most of the AI algorithms. Uh, I can demonstrate it using one example. Suppose I tell you um, John pounded a nail onto the wall and now I ask you the question, was the nail horizontal or vertical? Most of you can come back and answer that question. Uh, you did not go and look up a database. You didn't do a Google search. Uh, you, what, it, was, it was not written down somewhere that if you want to pound a nail onto the wall, you have to keep it horizontal. How did you, how did you learn that? <laughs> this is, you learned it using your experience. You learned it by interacting with the world. And all that knowledge is stored in you and is accessible to you at any time you want. This is the problem of common sense. And that is, that is one problem that AI hasn't solved yet. And uh, that would be the next frontier to crack. So actually, before, I, I want to sort of insert, because there's another question that's raised by your statement, and that is, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about what AI can do with very clear and logical rules. We've ascertained that it can do very well with large amounts of data with a very clear model about the outcome. But I think that humans interact in society. So we actually interact, and we make decisions on a regular basis based on a variety of things not simply logic or maximizing what we would say utility. Uh, there are many decisions that are made about, and, and actually I can go into, I, I'm going to let Wendell go into this, but there are real moral questions about how we interact with each other as humans. So for instance, there's been quite a lot of discussion at my university with my students about autonomous cars and how an autonomous car should make a decision when faced with saving the passenger in the car versus five people in an oncoming car. What are, and those decisions are obviously made still by humans to the extent that we're still programming those cars. But Wendell, this is right up your alley. Uh, the, the, sure. the example that I just gave you is commonly called in law and philosophy what we call the trolley principle. Uh, it was actually uh, Philippa, Foote. Philippa Foote in 1978 yeah. who did this. She's a professor of philosophy at MIT. Yeah. But I think this actually has very big implications for how we think about AI in our society because our discussion is almost exclusively limited to things like games and very clear logical decisions, but never about society and how humans interact and how decisions are actually made. 
So these societal concerns and these embodied concerns, they may be one of the main reasons why computers are a long ways from realizing some of human-like intelligence, if ever. You know? And uh, we won't be able to go into all that detail right now, but let me just allude to one thing in regards to these trolley car-like problems that some of you may have heard of, of whether the, the self-driving car should hit a few pedestrians or drive off the bridge and kill you, the passenger. On Thursday, Science Magazine printed a new piece of research that basically quizzed people on this, and it asked them, well, what should the car do? And a vast majority of them, in nearly all examples, said the car should be programmed to be utilitarian. In other words, the greatest good for the greatest number, save the maximum number of lives. But they were also, in some of this research, asked a very different question. The different question was, would you buy a car that was programmed that way? <laughs> and the vast majority of people said, no. <laughs> now, some of us had been predicting that this would, would be the outcome. But it's very problematic from a social point of view, and it's very problematic from the introduction of autonomous cars onto the road, which are when you think of it simplistically, well, isn't that all just mechanical? The car stops at a stop sign. If it sees it a, a ball in the road, it looks out for a child and gets ready to break. No, there are many dimensions of driving that are social in characteristics, and those will have to be solved in one form or another before they can be introduced. But this is one of the fascinating issues here of how we are even going to solve this. Consider autonomous cars. By some estimates, they could save 90% of the fatalities that we see on the road. And if people will refuse to drive a car because it is programmed in this one in a million or two million chance that that will occur in its car, we could actually lose tens of thousands of lives every year because people do not buy such cars. So this becomes a major issue for public policy in terms of how will we introduce these forms of artificial intelligence into the commerce of daily life. So I want, I want to give the audience a chance to ask some questions of the three panelists, but I have one last question for Mr. Lee, and that is, uh, based on what you heard today from your fellow panelists about the future of AI and the increasing ability to crunch data and make these kinds of decisions, the blurring line between what we call creativity. How do you think about the future of Go, the academies in Korea that train these children from a very early age? How do you think your daughter will view the game of Go in 15 years? I don't know whether my understanding is correct or not. Can you, the Korean interpreter is asking him to repeat. Give me one second and we'll see if we can make it clear. Uh, actually, we have been listening to your colleagues, the other panelists on the stage, talking about AI. So from the other panelists, we'll be talking about the uh, complexity of AI. So for the future of Go, what do you perceive? You have your own daughter. Right? In 10 years' time or 15 years' time, how would your girl uh, perceive Go? And also in Korea, a lot of young people being you know, trained to play Go. What about their perspe perspective? In the future, uh, so it might be difficult for machines to defeat man, but I believe uh, that AI will develop and human beings will develop too. And this will definitely have an impact on the Go game. And uh, probably, so one day, so we will conquer. 
the machines. Anyway, I think it's more important for human beings to have the games, to compete in the games. In about 10 to 15 years time, the AI age might come and drive driverless cars will be a reality. This is natural. And they will not, they will not cause too much uh, confusion among human beings because they are different from Go games. Driverless cars are not that difficult. Human beings and driverless cars can coexist with each other. Or in other words, so if we have driverless cars, human beings don't need to drive it anymore. If uh, there are a lot of driverless cars, uh, the rules will got, become very simple. However, if the car is uh, driven by AI, so you might find that there are a lot of uh, potential problems. So if there are a lot of uh, driverless uh, cars uh, on the way, we will not need drivers anymore. So this uh, might happen in about uh, 20 to 30 years time. And in the future, probably, so the cars, cars will be driven by AR. However, I don't think it will become a reality in about uh, 20 to 30 years of time. Thank you. Thank you. I'm from Caixin Media, and I want to put forward uh, one question to Li Sido. Um, we know that you've, pre uh, you've tried your best in the battle, but do you feel the same? Um, do you, in your opinion, you didn't play good enough, or you should have played play better? Um, so do you think that human can beat AlphaGo? And no offense, because some people say that the AlphaGo doesn't play perfectly, but the human played worse. So that's why the AlphaGo can win the game. So uh, in your opinion, how do you see this view? Thank you. So I agree to you to some extent. While I played with the AlphaGo, I uh, felt that I could have defeated the AlphaGo if it continued to play that way. So I know that there are still a lot of difficulties when AlphaGo played the Go. So if we play the white, we still have a lot of opportunities to win. However, what surprised me was that in about six months' of time, AlphaGo made a lot of uh, progress. Three months have already passed. It's really difficult for us to measure the progress the AlphaGo has already made in the last, uh, uh, last three months. I was defeated because uh, uh, of my misjudgment and miscalculation. So it has nothing to do with my skills of a play in the go. So if I try to try it again, I probably can defeat it without any uh, miscalculations. Excuse me. Um, uh, and I'd like to thank all the panelists for the insightful discussion today. Um, I was just talking about the fact that 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 the We have uh, talked uh, quite a lot about uh, AlphaGo. You have a daughter. If uh, your uh, daughter uh, learns the Go game from AlphaGo, do you agree or not? Why? Well, I fully agree. In education, I think uh, 
there are a lot of uh, really good educational experts, but there might also be not so competent uh, educational expert. So if uh, we don't know what the teachers uh, might be like, I will not allow my uh, daughter to learn the game uh, from it. However, AlphaGo is accurately de de uh, designed, and therefore I take a very positive attitude towards it. I will allow my daughter to learn the game from uh, AlphaGo. Wow, so this is uh, uh, just about uh, learning the game, learning the Go game uh, from uh, AlphaGo. However, at the same time, I have to admit that there are indeed a lot of uh, good educational experts. And uh, each of us uh, might uh, have uh, some uh, uh, shortcomings. It's impossible for everybody to be really good educational expert. Seems to me uh, there is a blending of uh, two models. One is the model of intuition. The other is the model of rationality. And the goal, of course, uh, is a game uh, of Eastern culture, by and large. But now it's the Western culture, which is based on the model of rationality that has beat uh, the Eastern model, mm -hmm. my observation. But ultimately, it should be a blending of both. And it seems that uh, and a rationality model uh, deals better in terms of a closed up system, whereas a uh, model of intuition uh, will be more creative in terms of an open system. But my question is uh, now, if the observation is close, uh, not deterministic, uh, what implications uh, will that have for uh, the education? that he has a Chinese education vis-a-vis -a, -vis a, a Western education. India probably is uh, a model somewhere in between. So I, the question is uh, actually addressed to all uh, the panelists. Well, I think this is, a, this is truly the central question that we need to be addressing. I mean, we, we have had all these predictions about how many jobs, for example, are going to be replaced by machines. So by some estimates of Osborne and Frey, 47% of the jobs in the United States could be replaced by automation of the present jobs. And when the World Bank used similar methodology, it came up with 69% in India and 77% in China. So if that's truly the case, and even if those numbers are way off, let's say they double what the actual loss is, we're talking about tremendous numbers of jobs being lost. So the, so the central concern is, what are we training our children for in the future? What is it about humans that they can really contribute? How should they be working together with and cooperating with these technologies to go beyond what any machine alone could realize by bringing machine capabilities and human capabilities together and perhaps bringing about forms of superintelligence that nobody had even considered in the past? So I think this becomes the, the central issue and should be the central issue for all societies in the future, to think more deeply what it is that we bring to bear on these problems and not get so caught up in these comparisons between machines and humans, but look at how machines might augment human intelligence and how human intuition and human creativity and human adaptiveness and human capability to be ethical, conscious creatures could enhance the quality of life for all of us. I can add to that. Uh, we didn't stop playing chess when machines beat us on chess. Uh, we still uh, keep playing chess. There are uh, competitions in the US called the spelling bees. Uh, it's not because computers are worse than humans at spelling. No, they are better at uh, humans than spelling. Uh, but we, we play games, we uh, you know, uh, take part in activities to improve ourselves. And uh, many of us are fortunate to have careers which are rewarding for us. We, we, are, we uh, see our careers as improving our own skills, rewarding for us. Many people are not fortunate enough to have those uh, careers. Many, you know, they are, and uh, what AI can give is uh, produce enough so that people can pursue their passion. 
uh, can, and it's not because uh, that passion cannot be done by machines better. It's because we, we enjoy doing those things. And uh, just like we enjoy playing chess, even though machines are better than us, it's about our own uh, self-improvement. And I think that's what we will focus on. We will focus on human connections uh, yeah. more than uh, you know, having to uh, worry about earning the daily bread. I, uh, we have time for one more question, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to move to this side of the room only because I've been looking in this way. So I think we have one question over here. A very simple question in Chinese. So just now we talked about the intelligence of a machine, which is acquired through learning. So let's just imagine AlphaGo uh, plays uh, with uh, a low end, not so good player. Does that mean that uh, the AlphaGo might become uh, very silly if it plays uh, the Go with uh, a not really competent uh, player? So can you answer that simple question, please? <laughs> uh, well, if uh, that is the case, so, so the speed might be very slow. And besides, uh, a deep learning depends a lot on data. If you don't have the data, it's impossible possible for you to have uh, the deeper learning, whether uh, AlphaGo plays with a professional player or a not so good player, it always uh, takes some time. But what is important is that AlphaGo can improve a lot within six uh, months. However, if AlphaGo plays with, uh, not, uh, with a not so good player, it might take about 60 years before it can accomplish what it has already accomplished. Thank you. Being here today. I think for me, uh, as I was preparing for this panel, reading and learning more about Go, what, I, what struck me as most interesting was it just comes to the core of what it means to be human. And I think what Wendell said was absolutely right. Our ability to make ethical and conscious decisions is that in danger? Is that something that we should worry about with machines? How do we really live with these machines? How do we think about doing this in such a way that is for the betterment of the entire world? And actually, Andy Salerno said something after uh, the match, which I thought really summed up this session quite well. And he said that AlphaGo isn't a mysterious beast from some distant unknown planet. AlphaGo is us. It's our incessant curiosity. It's our drive to push ourselves beyond what we thought was possible. Uh -huh. So there's no shame in a human losing to AlphaGo because AlphaGo could never demonstrate its own abilities without us, without somebody of Mr. Lee's capa capacities and abilities to challenge it. And I think on that note, I'd like to thank the audience and thank our panelists again. Thank you.